Hello, good morning, good afternoon, whatever appeals to you. Welcome back to the vault, guys. This is Vulcan, and today we're in for a doozy, okay? I need you guys to strap in, grab some popcorn, grab some soda for those health-conscious people, grab some broccoli and some water. But we're going to be taking a deep dive into Pantheon Rise of the Fallen lore. Now, this is going to be a long video, like I said. Um, the lore in Pantheon is nuts. It is crazy. Um, it's very complex. Um, there's a lot of callouts that aren't exactly clear. Um, there's a lot of callbacks of things. I'm sure it'll all make sense once we you know, get more uh, into the game, get more hands-on with the game, things like that. But, for the most part, um, I had to read through it a few times in order to fully comprehend and understand it, which is the makings of a good lore writer. Um, so whoever wrote this, uh, high five to them because they did a really wonderful job. Now, the cool thing is this lore is written from the point of view of a scribe, somebody regaling the tales of the past, but also um, talking about the tales of the current. So pretty cool. And that leads to interpretation. And interpretation leads to just kind of interesting uh, recounts that you pull out of it. Um, me and my colleagues were talking about uh, this game, and we both, you know, all read through the lore, and we were talking about it. Uh, me and another individual uh, understood it one way, and then um, there was three other individuals that understood it a different way. So it's just kind of a really cool little mashup that they have. Either way, I'm going to go through the lore, guys. I've picked out um, sort of the high overview um, of the lore so there's some stuff that I left out depending on whether it was of importance or a side note or anything like that I highly encourage all of you guys to go out to the actual page and read through the lore fully um, a note of encouragement uh, the first three ages or three pages the history age of seclusion and age of chaos aren't really gonna make a ton of sense until you get towards the end of the age of chaos and then read the frail age and then that's when things start to click so uh, just power through. All right. <clears throat> well, without further ado, let's go ahead and let's get into the lore of Pantheon. So Pantheon takes place on Terminus. So Terminus has a long history, riddled with wars, peaceful lulls, subterfuge, and the world of Terminus was a, was actually called something different. It was called Nistirok, and for most of its life, there was the dragon kind that ruled over it, known as the Rainborn. Um, there was a singular dragon king, Rock Nil, Rock Hill Thamos. Um, this dragon was huge, immense size, strength. I mean, it was just giant, overpowering literally anything within the realm. Even his own father, um, so Rock Nil Thamos and his dad, hailing from the sky, laid siege to the kingdom beneath the sea, known as Solcromain, in a tactical sweep. After the dragon king of Solcromain was defeated, the dragon king of Air, uh, Rock Sulfian, Sulfian Sire, who is Rock, Hil Rock Hilthamos' uh, dad, actually mourned the loss of the uh, Dragon King of Sol Cromain because it was his brother. So, Rock Hilthamos, who was the son of Rock Sulfian Sire, was enraged that his father had forgotten to immediately name him the heir to the throne and of the new Sol Cromain, essentially, realm. And in a fit of rage, actually usurped his dad and killed him, taking the throne for himself. This began the reign of Rock Hilthamos. Many centuries, um, this happened many centuries before the Sacred Six arrived. Now, the Sacred Six are the original six races of Terminus. Now, they arrived post Reign of Dragons. Um, it is called out specifically that this term is now common speak to address any group of new arrivals, no matter the actual quantity um, of races, so people showing up. So, for an unknown reason, after centuries of rule, uh, essentially the Rainborn, the dragons, just left their lands, retreating to places that were nearly impossible for mortals to traverse, locate, and basically just ghosted. They're gone. Um, there is a legend, though, that the dragons will actually reap a great reward one day, and have since entered into hibernation to wait for that bounty. <clears throat> Many cults have been established to worship these dragons, in hope that they'll return, and the cults are able to partake in that bounty, is their hope. So, though there's actually no proof of that, um, that's something that a lot of different races um, today in the, quote, frail age are engaging in. So this is spun from a Legend of the Dragon Accord. And the Dragon Accord is an agreement between Rock Hilthamos and a powerful being. We don't know what it is, unknown origin, it's just something that's out there. Well, unfortunately, um, you know, only three of those pages of the Dragon Accord still exist. They were either, the others were either lost to the wind, lost to time, or have since been just secluded away and somebody has them. 
But as part of that agreement, the world was renamed from Avenzul, which is interesting because Avenzul was never specifically called out. Um, in the lore, the world was actually called uh, Nistirok by the dragons, yet it was renamed from Avenzul. So I'm not entirely sure. Unless Nistirok is the realm of Terminus, the, the landmass of Terminus, and Avenzul was the world whole? Not entirely sure. Um, but anyway, it was renamed to Terminus. So this was confirmed by local natives, such as the Tholin of Ithalus and the Elvenin of the Elvenin Giants of King's Reach. And the Tholin began a new calendar to coincide with the dragon's departure, known as the Istobrun Hilgian, or IH for short. And we will be using IH, believe me. Um, as the new races began to arrive, so new individuals, new races of, of creatures started just to show up on Terminus. Um, we're not entirely sure, were they teleported here, were they transferred here, and the races don't know either. They went to bed one day in their old home and they arrived on Terminus suddenly, um, or were they just suddenly created on Terminus? No one really knows. Um, it's not called out in the lore anywhere. So lore speaks that they simply appeared one day, and the races, the races aren't sure where they came from either. The dwarves of Uldassa arrived in 7 IH and they were the first race. The elves came in at 9 IH, followed by the ogres in 12. The dwarves held meetings from time to time, but for the most part, these races kept to themselves. So after the fall of the ogre king, Rothuk the Black Moon, who was essentially lost to madness in 23 IH, the Age of Seclusion began. Now there's three ages total. The Age of Seclusion, the Age of Chaos, and the Frail Age. Now the Age of Seclusion, as you might have guessed, it was fairly true to its namesake. The three races kept to themselves, each having internal conflicts and triumphs. The ogres were reeling from defeats in the third and fourth Woschae Wars, um, which are internal wars. The elves were cultivating and nurturing their lucent tree, similar to a world tree from what I gathered, at the foot of the Rhone Mountains, while binding the first three seals of the seventh Seven Locked Door. Now, we're not entirely sure what the Seven Locked Door is yet. That's not in any sort of the lore. That's not from anything I could find, um, but it is on the actual in-game map, and it is mentioned only once in the lore, and it's right there. So Kazus, the dwarven god, uh, ruled Terminus successfully during these times, but a mystery was beginning to unravel from the Dragon Accord, one that affected everyone, not just the gods. It was known as the Celestial Boundary. And during the imprisonment of Razak, so Razak is a vile god, he's immortal, hellbent on consuming the dwarven race. That's his, like, his go-to. So Lockenhammer, who was the dwarven godhead, essentially exchanged immortality with Razak, knocking Razak down a notch, to a high mortal status uh, known as dissension so essentially lock and hammer picture him as the god of the dwarves right um, he's above Kazus, he's above razik and razik and Kazus were on the same kind of page so imagine them as like a demigod almost um, so he knocked razik down into high mortal so high mortals in between god and human, so you can kind of think of it as like a half god in a way, um, known as dissension. And Razak was now free of his ancient mandate of balance in Old Asa. So Razak was the offset of Kazus. Kazus is good, Razak is evil, and they're kind of a yin and yang type of thing. So he was free of his ancient mandate, um, which forbade him from destroying the people of Kazus, right, the dwarven race. And he was punished for his crime of trying to destroy that race and was sentenced to a thousand years in the Tenebris Tundra. Kazus actually took on the dissension himself. Um, he wanted to drop down to a high mortal status and no longer be a, uh, a god figure. So he wanted to rule and abide intimately with his dwarves as their high mortal king rather than a god. This worked famously. He still leads his people today over 900 years later. So high fives all around. So in, in 450 IH, the third era of the collisions began. So the first two are not really explained, they're simply alluded to. So here we go, we're jumping right in on the third, thrice. So starting with the Jinto and their pantheon, the Infinite Union, which was crippled prior to the start of the era. The god of the Infinite Union, Itero, had been exposed to a vast and powerful force of destruction beyond even his control. So we're talking, this is a god of a pantheon, of a race of creatures. And it had been exposed to something so powerful, so corrupt, so just immensely consuming that he had no choice. So according to the high priest Simina, the immortal god began to suffer from his wounds like any common creature would that had a disease. Coupled with their sudden transference to Terminus, um, things were not looking good. So he got hit with this, they transferred to Terminus, bad news. 
So the queen of the union, Janavi, so Itaro's wife, chose to descend her husband's body to that of a high mortal in hopes that this would prevent his death, knowing it would actually keep them both apart. So, you know, your lovely sacrifice. However, this was not the case. <clears throat> he actually got worse. He got way worse. He deteriorated even further. He became a twisted half-god full of just violent darkness and chaos and just just raw power and malice. So much malice. And his gift of creation. So he create things, obviously. He's a god. But he twisted his gift of creation to raise an army of warriors resembling his own malevolent form. His powers were enhanced by what is called by Simona the eyeless face of an eclipse, so pure darkness. Um, and Simona told that in her confession of the downfall for Pantheon and her race. His creations were kept in secret for a long time as he slowly just built his army, just assembling these just twisted creatures. This has a very like Lord of the Rings type of thing to it, where they're you know birthing the orcs or whatever. Um, kind of a similar thing, raising an army in the in the darkness of night. Um, however, Janavi began to catch on and confronted him. And he told her of his prophecy of a war of endless night that would consume everything, consume all of Terminus, and he was going to be the king, the lord. So he declared his new creation, the Revenant. And the Revenant were fierce. They were evil and they were fierce. And he changed his name. He called himself the Ravaging Lord, which we will call Lord from here on out. After his confession, he begged Janavi to marry him in chaos and rule together, rule in the darkness together. Let's just, let's take over the whole thing. So she replied with a cunning lie. Allow me to hold the face of day once more before we embrace the night together. And with that, she strung together a desperate plan. She actually bestowed her remaining power. This is a wife, a god of the Jinto. She bestowed her remaining power on the few people of her Jinto race left to protect them and immunize them from the ravaging lord and his disease. So... Essentially, the Jinto, the people that he's creating, the Twisted Warriors, were the Jinto. He was taking them and corrupting them and switching them. Her sacrifice protected the remaining ones, which were dubbed the Remnant. And they were zealots with incredible agility, unwavering focus to annihilate the Revenant. That is their entire focus. They're like superhuman creatures, just hell-bent on destroying the Revenant. So, when Itero discovered her sacrifice... There was a wave of light and sound that roared across the realms because um, she had died. She'd passed. She took all of her her soul, her energy, everything that made her up and pushed it into the remaining um, populace of her people to form the rev the remnant. And um, it was almost like an explosion that just whoosh, roared across the realm. Well, his howling shriek matched. He was upset and it shook the realms themselves. It is said that a lone flicker of her sacrifice flew and struck him in the chest, burying itself um, in his just very essence. And a few days later, the deicide war began. For those who don't know, deicide uh, is also deity, a god war. So the god war began. The war was fierce. So the remnant fought well and as one. Um, so they were very just like, you know, uh, almost like, like the 300. Imagine like the Spartans from 300 and Revenant or the Persians, right, coming down. So the Revenant were weakened by the Ravaging Lord still suffering from his wounds, and his power was not yet fully realized, so he was still very young in his tenure of power. The Remnant withdrew in 455 IH and retreated to a land east beneath Mount Holther um, in the realm of Greater Sath. So the Remnant pushed him back, guys, and <clears throat> um, the Revenant were like, hey, we can't do anything, we're out. Like, we got we to gotta jet because our Ravaging Lord is hurt, um, we're not really coordinated in what we're doing. Um, this is kind of just a shit show, so we're going to dip out. And they went back to Greater Sath. Well, Olim's Hill sat nearby, and the Jinto remnant set up a careful watch um, there to, to make sure they could keep an eye on the revenant. They couldn't fully see what they're doing, but they could see if they came up over the hill type of deal. Um, so almost just like an outpost. Cool. So, so ends the Age of Seclusion. And now we're moving into the Age of Chaos. So the Age of Chaos is where I'll say all the action is. Um, naturally, it's namesake, the Age of Chaos. So I would say the Age of Seclusion, we're going to do a quick little uh, overview here, was more about every race kind of taking care of themselves, right? As obviously it's namesake. The dwarves took care of some internal conflict, knocking down both their gods, dropped down to high mortal status. Um, Lock and Hammer, essentially the 
father of the gods, um, took care of that business. Razak was banished to the Tenebrious Tundra. Kazus stayed to rule his people. And then you have the Gento and their god uh, suffering from a corruption disease, and he complete, became completely twisted, raised an army of just monsters, basically, and went to wipe out his own people. His wife sacrificed herself to give birth to the remnant. And now here we are. So the Age of Chaos, guys, here we go. Um, when the second era of collisions began, once again, um, first era of collisions, we're not entirely uh, certain what that was. We just get called out in second certain ones. Uh, obviously, the first one didn't have too much going on. Um, when the second era of collisions began in the spring of 450, the Age of Chaos also began. And nearly on top of each other came the Mirror of Isil, which are known as the Dark Mirror. Um, they're kind of the water elf creatures. And this is a new race. And then the Ogres of Broken Maw, um, which would be, they, they came in near the Ogres of Broken Maw, which um, soon became the Continent of Rainfall. And then the Archai of Roa had dropped in to the south in the realm of White Thaw and were nearest to the dwarves. So the Mir and Archai formed a near instant rivalry, arguing over <laughs> which came to Terminus first, though it's never been exactly determined. The following Cursed Frost of 459 saw the humans of Vast Demith pushed against their own mountains. So, uh, basically, this frost was horrific, and um, they huddled against their own mountains to try to survive, uh, mercifully close to the elves, and the elves were able to help them out and help them survive. So, these were the original Sacred Six. The Dark Mirror, the Ogres, the Archai, humans the dwarves, and the elves. So those were the original six. And yeah, so those were the sacred six. Um, and they, for the, a long time, it was just them that kind of ruled the whole land. Pretty great times. However, however, in 470, the Age of Chaos began full swing. And it was just plainly named the year of the outbreak. This is the year approaching um, of the approaching deicide war it came to full term. So as you guys know before, right, there was the Remnant and the Revenant kind of battling it out. And then, um, so began the Deicide War. Now, the Deicide War is the War of the Gods, came full term, and the Revenant that were in the bunker of the Greater Sath, um, following the retreat from their defeat back in uh, uh, the Gento homeland, right, they exploded from the Greater Sath, just erupted quickly overwhelmed the Gento in Olam's Hill and destroyed that place, renamed the outpost uh, to Bakern, Bakern, or Black Flame. Aside from the impressive magnitude of their numbers, the Lord actually revealed an act of cunning. The six pantheons had, they were hosting very evil members. So people that were upset with their pantheon, and they're itching for a chance to gain power that was withheld by the celestial boundary, which is an agreement to avoid killing each other, basically, and taking land and um, <clears throat> upsetting the balance of life. So the Lord essentially put out an offer to those interested in serving him. They would gain rule, ruin, and revenge. This seduced a few key members and fallen deities of note. So half gods, high mortals, people like that. Asari of the humans and Hathas Krevig, Kreg, Krev Gij. Um, we're calling her Hathus from here on out, um, of the Archai. So you essentially get Asari of the humans and Hathus of the Archai. And while they're immortal, they're incredibly powerful, and then they're boosted by the Lord's favor and his resources. The Lord began his assault on all of Terminus, with Kinosai, a uh, small town, falling, or city, sorry, falling in 471. The Lost Sidrith falling in 472, both to his will and just overwhelming might. The Sidrith Vespers, in 472, and the Earth Mages of Majin Kai in 472, actually, um, they end up allying with the Emerging Titan, uh, basically out of fear, right? They were scared of, okay, if we don't ally with this guy, he's going to wipe us out, so ugh, we better cut our losses. So as his army and power grew, he split his ranks into three distinct armies, complete with their warlords. Asari struck on King's Reach, Hathis attacked the Snows of White Thaw, and the Lord himself sought to lay siege on rainfall so the remnant and the six they didn't sit around and just watch this though they were actually leading a guerrilla war effort um basically on the approaching armies on their brethren 
They had a critical victory in 475, and this served of vital importance. They were able to stall out the revenant and then cast a fog of war of the union that was forming between the six. So they were so coordinated in their guerrilla warfare attempts that the revenant were scattered. They weren't able to fully just you know link up and unify, but at the same time, there was a misconception that the six were actually operating independently. So while they had helped each other from time to time, there were no efforts in the past to combine forces and assault the revenant threat. However, in 475, an island typically hidden beneath the sea known as Vesu had appeared as it usually does every few months. The seas split, the island of Vesu is emerged, and you can see it. The six came to council and they struck what's known as the Sanctum Edict, bringing them into a single accord. Three sanctums were going to be established. The Burning Sanctum in the petrified forest of Ka Cathar, the Silent Sanctum nestled in a choke point within the Rhone Mountains, and the Frozen Sanctum buried into the drifts of the Tenebris Tundra. These were established to serve as holding points and were to be occupied when they bled as much attrition from the Revenant as possible. These sanctums were dubbed coffins to outlast the night. Essentially, they were safe. They were, I think it was bunkers. So they did as much as they could on the outside, and when they got pushed back, they would fall back to the sanctum, and that would be their last holdout. These things would seal shut, and they would just either the, the Revenant got in and they wiped them out, or the seals and the magic would hold, and they would outlast the Revenant. That type of deal. So in 471, or I'm sorry, 481, the deicide war, dubbed the War of the Gods, as we discussed earlier, came of age on Terminus. After years of small conflicts, nations were lost, and those people were forcibly, uh, you know, they were forced into serving the Revenant. The assaults had consummated into a total all-out war. So the efforts in grinding battle for the Six were disheartening, because besides Kazas, there were no equal to the high mortals on the battlefield. Hathus fared the worst uh, during this time. She had no match, but she fared the worst because she was unable to overcome the actual tundra herself. The tenebrious tundra um, was so horrific and just brutal that she was having difficulty just besting the land. So during the summit at Vesu, Kazus was quoted um, to saying, you know, he was asked, what was a natural defense that the frozen sanctum would have? Kazus said, tenebrious and tenebrious alone, he replied serving a purpose that that landscape is brutal. The dwarves in the Archive fought a battle of illusion, right? Forbidding the heiress, who's Hathus, she's known as the dead heiress, an opportunity to use her sheer number advantage. So once more, guerrilla warfare. Unfortunately, Hathus was finally given an opportunity to assault the sanctum itself. She ordered the mages of Majin Kai to create pillars of black flame that slowly encroached around the sanctum. The dwarves in the Archive preferred a traditional war themselves, but eventually the sanctum uh, but eventually had fallen back to enter the sanctum. So the revenant are basically pounding on the doors. King's Reach did not fare well at all. Um, that continent, uh, bad news. The humans and the elves fought to hold their ground, but there was little choice other than to meet a sorry head on. Havensong, which is essentially the human capital, it was a, near the silent sanctum, and it had fallen along with human king Amonsol, and the betrayer Asari demanded the entire city was wiped off the face of the world the planet. He hated this place so much, he literally verified that every timber, stone, hinge, doll, hair was thrown off a cliff, and that there is zero, zero possible way that five years from now, anyone would have noticed that Haven Song was even a city. He then marched on Sanctum, so he turned his gaze towards that. It took a few months to, to wipe clean Haven Song, but he did it, and then he marched on Sanctum. Rainfall had actually hosted the most brutal warfare. So at first it seemed like the ogres had the upper hand. The legendary armor of the Broken Maw um, attacked the Revenant in their own camp, so they actually launched the assaults themselves and ambushed. Um, so after this, uh, after they started, you know, wiping out different camps, doing things like that, and really kind of leading a forceful and aggressive assault, the Dark Mirror were actually waiting patiently underneath the icy surface of the water. Um, so armadas and transports and convoys and things like that were trying to get across the, uh, the ice and the dark mirror, oof, they wiped them out, um, breaking all the ice, sinking everything and then destroying them while they were within the water. Um, so it was a very cool tag team, like one, two punch. However, the ravaging Lord was not pleased 
and withdrew the feeling of victory from the mirror and the ogres and he unleashed terrors or horrors of the deep against the mirror and soon that water advantage was gone the ogres and the mirror were unable to defend had to retreat to the burning sanctum at that point so at this point all three races or all three um uh, continents or whatever had withdrew into their sanctums aka the coffins to outlast the night and this is really the all is lost moment so they have lost all ground They've retreated into their sanctums. They retreated into their their bases, their strongholds, their bunkers, to try to, you know, push back the revenant, fight, you know, for their essentially their survival, their race's survival, fight for the continent, fight for terminus, and this was it. So the ravaging lord tasted victory on his lips, anxious to finally realize the prophecy of an endless night. And in 484, the Relsiren of the Archai, which I'm assuming is the leader of the Archai, was actually slain. He sealed himself outside the door to buy some time. Um, and then the Lord also found a way around the magma moat that encircled the burning sanctum. So their defenses were gone. Midnight was drawing nearer. Janavi, the wife of Itero, aka Ravaging Lord, she had a vision that she bestowed upon her people, and that vision saw past the Ravaging Lord's vision. The Ravaging Lord's prophecy was a prophecy of endless night. Janavi saw past that, and the sons of Terminus would break upon the world. And no one really understood what that meant. However, the sons of Janavi's vision would actually rise um, prior to the, the, uh, the Ravaging Lord making his way into the Burning Sanctum. And with them came a morning that broke the revenant into absolute chaos the six sons of terminus appeared the six sons of terminus were warriors of godlike power in might arcane discipline one hailed from each pantheon of the sacred they were known as war wizards these were ogs these guys just like absolutely wreck things i mean they're nonsense so they are beings right though they're high mortal they're of pure supernatural ability. High mortals typically have a aptitude in something, but a failure in something else. War wizards are all around badass, so they're tough to beat. Um, as they arrived, the terrors that uh, the terrors, as they call them in the lore, I'm going to go ahead and just say the war wizards, just launched an all-out, just pounding assault on Asari and Hathis. Absolute ferocity. Hathis fled and. She has since been thought dead, uh, though we're not really sure. Asari raced and managed to wound, uh, raged, sorry, uh, and managed to wound one of the wizards. So he really just like lost his damn mind and was just like, let's do it. Let's, let's give my axes. I'm just going to go all out. And he wounded one of the wizards, but his might could not overthrow him. And he fell dead on the very spot that Haven Song once stood, as if preparing his own grave. The Ravaging Lord was not so easily countered, though, so he withdrew to Mount Kadruhor in the north, and the Revenant were now leaderless, their allies chased them from the continents except for the Lord. In these conflicts, Avendil, uh, or Avendir, sorry, the young heir to Amonsol, the fallen uh, human king, actually showed himself a leader. In 455 or 485, he and Kazis led the armies of the Six with the War Wizards, and they marched upon Mount Kadruhor to extinguish the black flame forever. The Revenant were scattered, so he only had a, I would say, a fraction of the vast army that he once had um, actually defending the mountain with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in this short time, the Ravaging Lord had actually grown in power and desperation. So he unleashed a magma flow, not caring really who was caught within the grasp. His army, theirs, didn't matter. He just sent out magma flows to just wipe out whoever was on the mountain. The army of the six was split and trapped, becoming easy prey for the Revenant. So essentially they were fighting a battle of 19 fronts, right? They were just fighting on the mountain, trying to get their way up, but for the most part, they were in a stalemate. However, two of the war wizards managed to move directly onto the Lord, knowing that his death would end everything. So after a furious battle, one of the wizards lay dead and the other was in serious peril. You gotta remember, the Ravaging Lord, though, he was, he's a high mortal. He was once a god, somebody that was absolute utmost power, dropped to high mortal status. Now he's affected with madness, desperation. That's like a backed animal in a corner on 15 times, 15 types of different steroids. I mean, he is jacked up and ready to fight. So he killed one of the war wizards. The other one was seriously wounded. 
But these were not the mightiest heroes to arrive on that day. Suddenly the earth shook, and through an eruption, Rai Kafiros, the rainborn dragon who ruled over this continent, emerged. She had been locked away for centuries, and suddenly <sighs> erupted out of the ground. She landed between the Lord and the son of Terminus, the war wizard, and clutched the pillar of Ka. And the pillar of Ka were believed to be a signifier of rainborn authority over each continent. There was one per realm. So she clutched that and blew flames over all of the armies, disregarding who's who. She did not care and just incinerated everything down the side of the mountain. But before she could face either warrior, the Lord made his final move. With every fiber of his evil being, he impaled the head of the dragon onto the pillar. This was a poor decision. The dragon died, spitting flames for the last time. But as the death of the dragon had awoken the greatest beast to ever walk Terminus, Rock Hill Thamos. Rock Hill Thamos, the dragon, the mythic dragon of huge size, of immense, of just immense power, had awoken. He swooped down, picked up the Ravaging Lord in his mouth, crushed his body, threw him up in the air, and breathed flames to incinerate literally every inch of him into ashes, instantly ending the Ravaging Lord. Just like that. Gone. He drew in a breath that was going to suddenly wipe out everything. He was done. He was done. So he then turned his gaze towards all the armies. He was huge, easily the size of a mountain. Drew in his breath and was like, you know what? We're just going to go ahead and end this. I'm going to take my planet back. I'm done with this. These are children. As he drew the breath in, a hand, a giant hand, suddenly appeared and closed around the dragon's mouth and said, blood for blood, king. There is no breach. To which the dragon replied, Blood for grace, emissary, yet in the future there will be only blood. The hand released, and then Rock Hilthamos flew into the sky, disappearing, I'm assuming back in hibernation. That was the end of the Deicide War. So, there was a lot that went on during that age. The Age of Chaos, the War of the Gods, but it ended with the Awakening of the Dragons. And... As we move through, we see a few few other dragons, but we haven't seen Rock Hilthamos yet. And I'm assuming he's back hibernating or doing whatever he's doing. So following the Age of Chaos is the Frail Age. So the Frail Age is an interesting one. It's our current age that we're in. So the actual game itself is going to be taking place in the Frail Age. And um, I'm curious how they're gonna take it because everything before this sounds pretty badass. So the Frail Age itself, obviously, as per its namesake, is frail. It's very tender. It's something that's breakable. Um, so let's figure out why. So the Age of Chaos ended, but the world of Terminus lay in complete ruins from the war. Entire cities, realms, landscapes were just wiped away from the war, destroyed. And those that remained were irreparable. They were never going to be what they once were. That's just the way it was. The Frail Age began when the four, when four of the Sacred Six returned to Vesu five months after the end of the God War. The Dwarven, Human, Elven, and Archai Heralds stood tall in those sands. So those four races showed up and they saw our banners still stand tall. The Ogre banner was removed and just the cloth, the cloth banner, the post remained, but the Dark Mirror post was completely removed entirely as it was never, as if it was never even placed at all. So it sent a very clear message. No friendships, no kinships were fostered during the war. There was no, we came out on the other side, so let's all hold hands and be buddies. No. The Dark Mirror didn't want anything to do with anybody else. The Ogres, same. The only thing we have are the Dwarves, Humans, Elves, and Archai that seem to have fostered any sort of relationship um, out of this time of need. The newly appointed young king, Avendir, declared this age with a sentiment, quote, this age, whatever it holds, must be frail. And that is the beginning of the frail age. The year was 486. The age of chaos was officially over. So at this point, things actually moved pretty fast. More races were added. The people dropped in, the halflings, the scar, and the gnomes. The scar immediately took part in bloodshed, taking over a peaceful race, turning them into slaves, and then actually turning on each other into a civil war. They are very aggressive, very warlike, and they fight each other all the time. The halflings aren't said too much about. Um, we know that they live in the Wild's End, and they nurture trees, but 
This is a direct quote from the lore. They're better discovered in person than from text. The gnomes. So as you guys know, I'm going to break away from the lore for a second. As you guys know, the gnomes in this game are very different from gnomes in any other game. You think of gnomes, it's typically like a small human. In this game, they look to be like an arcane being. Like, not necessarily human in nature. More like a wrapping of um, cloth, metal, and just made up of pure energy. So, keep that in mind. But the gnomes kept themselves shut off from the world for 250 years, sticking to their floating skyhold. They didn't want anything to do with nobility that showed up. There was even a dragon, the snow dragon, um, <coughs> showed up at their doorstep to see what they're all about, and the gnomes still stayed shut off. However, after a constant, constant, constant barrage of requests from the Archai, the gnomes had entered an agreement to open their bridges and their gates, but keep their skyhold completely sealed off. So you're able to now walk about their essentially outer ring, but not see the inner sanctum quite yet. Um, we're hoping to see what that's all about coming soon. So Avendir, the, remember him, he was the, the young king that took over after Aemon's soul had perished his father. Well, he was a pretty good king. Everyone really, they loved him. They hailed him. He was somebody who fought fiercely, who was brave, who um, led fairly and justly. And the other capital of Havensong was actually wiped clean from the world by Asari. They rebuilt and established the city, a city, and they established two arches, one of death and one of life, that you must walk through to, quote, live their past. Some say you can feel the sting of death and the miracle of birth as you walk through those arches. Avendir died in 525 and was mourned by literally everyone on the continent. Everyone in the world um, mourned Avendir because he was such a just fantastic leader. So let's talk about what happened to the war wizards. The sons of Terminus. Well, according to lore, they simply disappeared. They're worshipped as gods now, rightfully so, as we would have been defeated without their help. But what of the actual revenant? Well, they're still around. There's no way to completely wipe them out. Most of them gathered back at Mount Holthir and Baca Urn. But there's another foe on the horizon. The Union of Shadow. So the Union of Shadow isn't really known where their origin lies, but we do know they're followers of the imprisoned mad god Razak, and have tried to control the world through offerings of power or offerings of power to people of power. So, whether it's high mortals, whether that's kings, whether it's mad magicians, whether it's wizards of another realm, they're trying to recruit everyone. And the interesting thing is, several assaults have been led on their city, but for some reason, the aim of the assaults had just turned. Um, when they marched upon the city, the armies would suddenly, quote, decide to not attack and they're thinking it's a lot of mind type of madness control type of stuff so that guys that concludes the lore we have caught up we're in the frail age the year is 987 ih that is where the scribe is signed off so guys that's the lore of pantheon rise of the fallen I really, really enjoyed doing a deep dive on this lore. I think it's a really, really cool, I mean, it's it's a cool story. Um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot to pull from. There's a lot of stuff that can happen. Um, clearly, there are uh, conflicts. Um, it, ma it makes me feel like I know each, each of the races. Wonderful writing. But I want to hear what you guys have to say. So in your mind, what are your guys' thoughts on the lore itself? What are your guys' thoughts on... Um, the story that we're going to be partaking in, The Frail Age. And really, I'm just curious, what are your guys' overall just kind of conclusion from the lore? Um, like I said, I urge you guys to go out to the website and read it yourself because there's some stuff that I left out. But for the most part, pretty great, huh? Pretty great. Um, all right, guys. Well, this has been Vulcan, and this is starting my first video of a playlist. Um, I'm going to be doing a kind of a... Uh, quite a few different deep dives into the realm, into the world of Pantheon. And um, lore is the first one. Next is going to be the races. And then we have classes. So, all right. I am signing off, guys. This has been Vulcan, and I am out.